I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the Scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. We have come finally to the letter to the seventh church of the book of Revelation, Laodicea. I mentioned at the beginning of this series in the book of Revelation that the seven churches are located in seven cities in a rough circle in the western part of Asia Minor. The city of Laodicea was located about 160 kilometers directly east of Ephesus, the first city to which these seven letters were addressed. So we have come full circle, moving from Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and finally to Laodicea. Every one of the seven letters to the seven churches that are found in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 ends with the same phrase, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It does not say what the Spirit says to the church, but what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus Christ, the author of these letters and the book of Revelation, did not write these letters to go separately to each church. All seven letters went to all of the churches, so they all read what the Lord Jesus was saying about the church just down the road. So they must have been anxious about the one that was addressed to them. Of these seven churches, five of them were threatened with judgment. Only the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia received no criticism or condemnation. Ephesus was on the brink of judgment because it had left its first love, even though it was still doctrinally sound. There was Pergamum, which had not denied the faith but was tolerating sin. Then there was Thyatira, where there were still some good things going on, but a compromise with evil had taken place, and the majority of the congregation seemed to have been involved. The letter to Sardis follows, a church with only a few genuine believers, a church which had a name but was actually dead. Right at the bottom of the list is Laodicea. Bluntly put, this was an unsaved church. If there were any believers in this church, they weren't even mentioned in the letter at all. Even in Sardis, the dead church, Jesus still says, Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. But in Laodicea, there was no one. Laodicea is a church that is characterized by lukewarmness that is typical of unsaved or unregenerate people. Laodicea has the grim distinction of being the only church where Christ has nothing good to say about anything. The church has simply no redeeming feature. This is the false church, an unredeemed church. Laodicea was part of a group of three cities and was closely associated with the cities of Colossae, to which the letter to the Colossians was written, and Heropolis. Laodicea was founded by King Antiochus II, who named it after Laodice. His wife, Laodicea, was noted throughout the Roman province of Asia for its wealth, its commerce, and its medical practices. Laodicea was the banking center of Asia, and it was by far the most prosperous of all the seven cities mentioned in Revelation. In AD 60, the city was destroyed by an earthquake, along with Colossae and Heropolis, but it alone refused aid from Rome for rebuilding, its wealth making it self-sufficient. Laodicea also had a flourishing clothing industry. There was a particular breed of black sheep in this area of Asia, and the glossy black wool was woven into special garments that were sold here. The city was also noted for its medical treatment, especially for its eye and ear ointment. The religious medical cult of Escalupius was located here. Escalupius was the pagan god of medicine, and his symbol was a staff of entwined serpents around it. This symbol is still used today as a symbol of medicine and hospitals. This will explain some of the references in this letter to the church of Laodicea. While Laodicea appeared to have everything, it actually lacked the most basic of resources, water. Unlike the mountain towns that had cold water streams like Colossae, or nearby Heropolis that had an access to hot springs, Laodicea had no water supply of its own. Water had to be piped in through aqueducts and by the time it arrived, the water was lukewarm and full of sediment. All the notable qualities of Laodicea, finance, black wool and eye ointment and the water supply play a major part in this letter. 
with all the letters, the Lord Jesus introduces himself in a very specific way. His opening introduction always introduces a key of what the church needs. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Jesus describes himself firstly as the Amen. Traditionally, we use this word Amen when we close a prayer or when we want to express our agreement with what someone says. It is a word that Jesus uses frequently. In some of the modern translations of the Bible today, Jesus begins many statements with the words, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you. Actually, in Greek, the word is Amen, Amen. So whenever you hear these words in the Gospels, you should know that Jesus is about to say something extremely important, and you should pay careful attention. We often use Amen as a final word, and it has that meaning too, when God speaks. The word of Jesus is the last word, the final word of God to man. Anyone who goes beyond the words of Jesus is not giving us a new truth, but they are departing from the final word that God has spoken. Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 2 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. Secondly, the Lord Jesus calls himself the faithful and true witness in verse 14. He has emphasized his truthfulness before in all these letters, but here he adds the word faithful. He not only tells the truth, but he tells all the truth. He does not hide anything. He is completely trustworthy. He is perfectly accurate and reliable. He is the way, the truth, and the life and wants this church to understand that. The third phrase is not, as some translations put it, the ruler of God's creation. It is really the word arche, which should be translated as the beginning of God's creation. It is the same word that the Gospel of John opens with in John 1, 1. When Jesus says he is the beginning of the creation of God, he doesn't mean that he was the first thing that God created. Jesus says he is the beginning of the creation, what he means is that he is the source or origin of it. He is the power by which creation began. Not only is Jesus the source of God's creation, the physical universe in which we live, but Jesus is also the source of the new creation that God is building. What creation is this? 2 Corinthians 5 verses 17 tells us what it is. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, Behold, the new has come. In the letter to Colossians, Paul explains that Jesus is the beginning of God's creation. In chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile us, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now it was important that the church in Laodicea particularly needs to know that truth. In chapter 4 of Paul's letter to the Colossians, he says specifically, And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. The Laodiceans had to be familiar with Paul's letter to Colossae. And in that letter, we have read that the apostle emphasized Jesus' link with creation. This church at Laodicea needs to be told an important truth, the whole truth, and especially truth about how to relate to God's new creation. What does the Lord see in this church at Laodicea? In every letter, Jesus says, I know your works. He is always aware of what goes on in every church. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. 
There were two problems in this church. First, there was something wrong with their commitment. They were neither cold nor hot. And also, there was something wrong with their self-image. They thought that they were rich, but they were really poor. The church at Sardis was a cold and dead church. The church at Philadelphia was hot and alive. But here in Laodicea was a church that was neither hot nor cold. It was merely lukewarm. And this is where Jesus links the state of the church of Laodicea with the state of their water. If you were living in Laodicea and turned on the tap to get a cold drink and tasted the water, you would probably be spit it out, because it was lukewarm and full of sediment. Simply stated, it was nauseating. The word Jesus actually uses here is not spit out, but vomit. The Greek word is emesiae. So Jesus would vomit out the church because it was nauseating to him. What created this condition? There is only one answer. It was compromise. When you want to make something lukewarm, you mix together hot and cold. Human beings generally do not like extremes of temperature. We moan when it is too cold and we complain when it is too hot. So for our comfort we mix the two together. We create what is comfortable. This is what happened in the church at Laodicea. They compromise spiritually for comfort's sake. It is always more comfortable to attend a church where no one takes the word of God seriously, where, for the sake of comfort, we avoid discussions over issues. This church was compromising its teaching for the sake of peace. They had enough truth to satisfy their conscience without becoming fanatics, but were relevant enough to ensure that they didn't put people off. In other words, they were a seeker-friendly church. Laodicea was a comfortable church. If you attended this church for years, it would be probably quite pleasant. There were no challenges, no rebuking or correction. Only encouragement and respect because it was a comfortable church. But it would be also a compromising church. What did Jesus think of a church like that? It was nauseating. It was repulsive. Many people might have liked it, but Jesus did not. It made him sick then, and there are thousands of churches like this around the world today. What is the most destructive and dangerous attitude a church can have? It is when the church belongs to the people, when they own it, and it exists for their benefit. That is what turns a church into a religious social club, operating only for the benefit of its members. In verse 17, Jesus declares that what they are saying and what they were were two entirely different things. This is the faithful and true witness speaking, the one who tells the whole truth, even though it hurts. This church at Laodicea was smug, proud, and complacent. They had plenty of money. They might have had a beautiful church building, gifted preachers and a great music group, and the respect of the community. They thought they were doing well, but Jesus says in verse 17 that although they said, I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing, they did not realize that they were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. With Laodicea being the center of banking in the province of Asia, there was probably more wealth in that city than anywhere else. But historians tell us that Laodicea also had a large population of beggars, wretched, pitiable, blind and ragged people, hoping to benefit from the wealthy inhabitants as they passed by. So there were extremes of wealth and poverty in this town of Laodicea. Why was there such a difference in the views held by the church in Laodicea and the Lord Jesus? It is because they were being measured by two different standards. If I was to ask you what the temperature was today, and you would look at the thermometer and say, it is 32 above zero, I might check another thermometer and say, no, you are wrong, it is zero. The truth is we would both be right because one thermometer was Fahrenheit and the other was centigrade. Zero in centigrade is 32 above Fahrenheit. If you use two different standards of measurement, you will never be able to agree on what the true temperature is. That is what was happening here. They were being measured by two different standards. Laodicea was using the standards of the world and they thought they were doing well but Jesus is using the standard of what he intended his church to be like. In scripture, Jesus tells us plainly what the standard of his church must be. Firstly, Matthew 5 verses 13, Mark 9 verses 50, and Luke 14 verses 34 all tell us that the church has to be salt. Jesus means that 
Like salt in food, it should be spread throughout the whole region, flavoring whatever it touches. The church does not function only when it meets on Sunday. The church functions where believers are, in businesses, offices, in shops, in homes, wherever believers are. That is where the church does its work. That is where the church can demonstrate and share the good news of the gospel and be salt, giving life a different flavor instead of being willful, wicked and depraved like the world. Secondly, the church is to be light. Matthew 5 verses 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Light always symbolizes truth. The church is to be the source of truth and vision. The church is called to make people understand the program of God throughout history and of interpreting the events of the day so that men see what God is doing, not what man wants to do. That is the work of the church, and judged by that standard, Laodicea had nothing. They were, in the eyes of Jesus, naked, poor, pitiful, wretched, and blind. Although each of these seven churches were seven distinctive churches, they were carefully selected to represent not only the spectrum of churches that existed in the first century AD, but the spectrum of all churches that exist now. Every church that truly knows Jesus as Lord can be recognized as fitting one of these seven types at one particular moment in its history. By either repentance or disobedience, a church may change from one type to another of these seven basic churches. But every church can always be found somewhere within the sevenfold pattern. Also, each of these seven letters represent the seven stages or key periods in church history. Each of the seven churches therefore represents a time period where the conditions described in that church match the conditions of that key period of church history. Now we have come to the seventh age of the church, and it should be clear, as both history and prophecy would confirm, that Laodicea is the church of our age, the last age of the church. This age is characterized by the trend of people dictating what will be taught. Although Laodice was the name of the wife of the king that founded the city, the name Laodicea in Greek is made up of two parts, laos meaning people and dike meaning law or principle. In other words, the law of the people, or to put it loosely, people's rights. That is the characteristic of our times, the rights of the people, where the people tell the ministers what to preach. We are seeing this happen today. The Apostle Paul predicted it in 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 to 4 when he said, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Once the church taught that a self-centered life, the natural life with which we were born, was something that needed to be daily crucified and denied. But today, churches are openly promoting self, the individual, saying that we should allow the self to express itself. Once the inerrancy of Scripture formed the foundation of all evangelical churches, and the Bible was fully accepted as the unerring Word of God, but now churches and theological colleges are rethinking the nature of the Scriptures and denying the inerrancy of the Word and claiming that we cannot trust the Word and that it must be judged by man before it can be accepted. This is the age of compromise, where instead of evangelizing the lost, we are being told that God is too loving to condemn anybody. What does Jesus offer this church and us as a solution? Jesus' appeal to this church falls into three simple divisions. Firstly, what is needed. In verse 18, he appeals for the church to buy from me. Jesus has all the church really needs to function. Nice buildings, great services, and beautiful music are not wrong, but they are not what the church needs. What the church needs can only be obtained from Jesus. Firstly, the church needs to buy gold refined in the fire. Peter describes what this gold is in 1 Peter 1 verses 7. The tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is what the church needed first. It lacked faith in God but was resting on its own abilities and the world's resources, but was resting on its own abilities or the world's resources. Secondly, they needed white clothes. Everyone is morally naked before God. Every one of us knows something about ourselves that we do not want anyone else to know, but God knows. He sees us in our nakedness. 
What does he offer to cover our nakedness, the righteousness of Christ? Throughout all seven letters, we have seen that white clothes stand for redemption, for the righteousness imparted by Christ. We are no longer to be clothed with our own self-righteousness, which Isaiah says is nothing but filthy rags in the sight of God, but we are to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ himself, a perfect righteousness which God accepts. White clothes also symbolize a changed character, someone who has taken his clothes and washed them in the blood of the Lamb. The third thing that was needed was eye ointment. Laodicea was noted for their eye ointment, but Jesus says they need spiritual eye ointment that will enable them to see. Throughout Scripture, we see the anointing of the Holy Spirit which opens eyes to understand the truth of God. John himself wrote about this in his first letter, chapter 2, verses 27. The anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. If we have the Spirit of Christ within, our eyes are open to understand the Word of God, and we see scriptures in a new and fresh and wonderful way. The second division of Jesus' appeal to the church is in verses 19 and 20. This shows us how to get this gold, white clothes and eye ointment. And even here, Jesus is always loving and kind. Despite this church's terrible weakness and failure, he tells them, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Verse 20 is one of the finest explanations in the whole Bible of how to become a Christian. I have heard this passage used many times when witnessing to non-Christians. I have witnessed lives changed by this beautiful description of Christ standing outside our lives, patiently knocking at the door of our hearts. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Although the invitation in verse 20 is one of the most familiar in all the Bible, it is also one of the most misunderstood. Jesus is saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But the door of what? It is not the door of our hearts. It is the door of the church. Jesus is saying, I am standing at the door of your church and I knock. Is there anyone who will hear my voice and open that door? I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. This is a church that Christ is not in. He is outside this church. There are thousands of churches like this where Jesus is outside, and in compassion he knocks, shut out of the church that bears his name. For either a church or an unbeliever that finds themselves in this situation, the Lord Jesus again gives three simple steps to remedy the problem. Firstly, there comes an awareness that Christ is outside our lives and is wanting to come in. This occurs when we feel our lives or the church is not what we want it to be, we feel empty and uncomfortable about ourselves, and when we hear the good news about Jesus, something within us responds. The second step is very important. We must open the door. Jesus will not open it. He is not going to force himself upon us. He never forces anyone into salvation. He offers it to us. But we must invite him in. Luke 13 verses 34 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Of course the third step is very clear. He will enter in. You do not have to feel him enter. He does not say that he will give you the feeling that he is there. It is a beautiful picture of him permanently dwelling with you. He will move in to live with you, and he promises it in John 1 verses 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In today's modern age, where it seems that everything is about human rights, here is a clear statement by God himself that we really only have one right, and that is the right to become children of God. The third and final part of the Lord Jesus' appeal is his promise to the overcomer or conqueror, this is found in verse 21. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. The promise here is that the church will share the Lord Jesus' reign. The true church is intended to reign with Christ, but Jesus makes a very careful distinction here. He distinguishes between his throne 
and his father's throne. The Father's throne is the sovereign government of the universe. The whole universe is under the Father's control, but Jesus has a throne as well. He calls it my throne, and the overcoming Christian is promised to reign with him on it. In scripture, that throne is called the throne of David. When the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary in Luke 1 verses 32 to 33, he said, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is a promise that relates to the time yet to come when Jesus assumes the throne of David and Israel is made the head of the nations. This is the millennial kingdom that has been mentioned several times in these letters already. The church resurrected and glorified is to share with him in that reign. In verse 22, for the last time in these letters, we hear Jesus say, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is not what the churches say about themselves or to the world, but what the Spirit says to the churches. The church must receive truth from God and spread it to the world. We do not originate truth. We do not think up the things that we would like to believe and then spread that around we are responsible to hear what the Spirit says to the churches and then to pass that along, just as we function as salt and light in the world. Are we listening to what the Spirit says to us in the church in 2021? The promises and the warnings to the seven churches are as relevant to our lives as they were to the lives of the first century believers. The seven letters could be summarized as follows. To Ephesus, do not let your love for Jesus grow cold. To Smyrna, do not fear the persecution of the world. To Pergamum, trust the word of God to keep you strong and faithful. To Thyatira, avoid both sexual and spiritual adultery. Be pure. To Sardis, wake up now. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. To Philadelphia, I will open a door of ministry and witness for you. To Laodicea, don't yield to complacency. Invite me in. Let me enter and transform your life. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 27. Music